let's go and start the music. Well, hello there, everybody, and welcome to Skyther live stream for tonight. Tonight is November 18th, 2022, uh, the evening of November 18th, and into the night of the 18th, into the 19th, um, around 1 o'clock in the morning or so, will be the Leonid's peak. Maybe we'll see something crazy, won't we? As usual, I have Daryl Mason here with us to... Uh, hang out and uh, talk smack about me all the time. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Anyway, how you doing, Daryl? I'm good. You? Yeah. I'm all right. I have not yet begun to smack. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I have not yet begun to smack. Sounds like a patriotic statement of some kind. If you yeah. like. Yeah. So, yeah, welcome, guys. Um, tonight... Um, you know, in publications it said that yesterday is when the lean had started and tonight, late, one in the morning, which puts us into the 19th, uh, is the peak, uh, supposedly. So we may see some pretty cool things. Um, and I'm going to, uh, since we know it's a lean meteor shower, I'm going to just slide that out of there. We don't need that card in there right now. So the lean, the, the constellation of Leo is going to be rising right about here uh, pretty soon. Actually, I'm going to make this a little bit better, a little easier to see. Uh, and I think we'll run like this. This way we can actually use our uh, enhancements and do this more often so it's a little bit better for us. Yeah, okay. So it's actually very clear here. It said it was not going to be clear. Who would have known? Who would have thought, right? Yeah. And then meanwhile, over in Arizona, there's the All Sky Cam. I won't do it the same way as last night. This this record will will stand. It's recording. That's a uh, uh, actually <laughs> what you're seeing on the screen in the lower left. That's actually bird poop uh, on the uh, uh, on it, um, and that's no fun. Uh, but that's what happened. Okay, so we see some bird poop right here. See our Milky Way, some clouds over uh, 65 miles toward Phoenix. Uh, and so we're going to let that keep going. This is already just counting up and doing uh, its thing. Uh, so we'll check back every now and then to see if we caught any meteors. Uh, and we'll be back to that as well. That'll be fun. But meanwhile, uh, back on the ranch here, uh, we have our uh, night sky. Again, our radiant for this is going to be down around here, right? And it's going to rise up in the sky this way uh, as the night goes on. Um, and we'll notice the uh, stars of Leo here soon. 
we do have the Manaceros radiant rising first, which is, I think, uh, might be right about here. I have to look and see. Um, but I should also uh, have our planetarium program running at the same time here. So I can stick that in the background as needed. So we'll do that. All right. So we'll have that up for you in a minute. Hey there, Robin Curtis. Hello there, Robert Waters. How are you? Nice to see you. Haven't seen you here before. It's good to see you. Simon Thompson is with us. Simon Thompson, um, I have a snack here. I just had two of them, and they're called Tim Tams. I bet you know what they are. I'll bet you do. James so, Dugan was going on about Tim, Tim Tams the other night. Uh, yeah, well, I have a whole big thing of Tim Tams right here. Because I also like Tim Tams. <laughs> I've never had them. I, I didn't know they were available here. Oh, no, yeah. Sure, you can get them on Amazon. But there's an Australian uh, shopping uh, 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 shop. Uh, I forget where it is. But it's an Australian shop that's uh, in, in town. And gives people an opportunity to uh, have Tim Tams as well. Oh, well, let's see here. Basically cookies, aren't they? Yeah, they are. But they're great. They're yeah, they're Simon wonderful. calls them. Biscuit, of course. Yes, they're biscuits with uh, chocolate on them, and they're like they're a cross between a Twix bar without the caramel, um, and uh, maybe a, a one of those real weird sugar wafers. Yeah, but they're really good. Uh, are you aware of uh, the difference of a biscuit between the British Empire and uh, the United States? At one point I was, but, you know, I, I didn't retain that information. Uh, what we call a biscuit in the U.S., uh, they is pretty much a, a scone in uh, the U.K. at least, probably in Australia too. Uh, and then what we call a cookie is what they call a biscuit. <laughs> okay, well, holy cow. All right. Well, and every, every time the subject of biscuits and gravy comes up, uh, they they go, you know, gravy on cookies. <laughs> As uh, Bernard Shaw or somebody said, we're two people separated by a common language. Yeah. <laughs> I think it was Shaw. Oh. Okay, so the radiant has already risen. It's down here. Uh, and it's going to be rising. You'll see it better as the, it gets a little higher, I think. Is this Algenib right here? I think this might I be. I think that's Algeba right there. Algeba, and then we got the top of the sickle here. Yeah, and I see Regulus is coming and going just to the left of that tree. Right there. Right there. Yeah, so here's the radiant right here. Uh, that's our first meteor. That is called the Commercial Airliner Meteor. I'm fairly certain that people recognize it. Um, let's see if we can see if we can adjust the colors down a little bit, make it a little more dark. There's another. There's the aircraft there, but there's another aircraft now. Is that an aircraft? Or is that? Yep. Yes, it is. Flashing red. Yeah, I mean, some of the stars were flashing red, too. Like, here we got another another thing that's flashing red. And that's, of course, another aircraft. We got one, two, three aircraft. At this time of the night, um, we see a lot of international flights. Uh, so uh, this is typically where they go, actually. So this whole flight corridor here is just loaded with aircraft starting at 5 p.m. Eastern Time. Because they're heading north over the pole or over Greenland to go toward Frankfurt, Munich, mm. Oslo, Copenhagen. When I went to Germany, we flew out of Dallas and uh, we left about 5 p.m. Dallas time. And uh, I think it was late August. And uh, mm -hmm. it was interesting. You know, we headed 
north or northeast, as you said, and uh, uh, it got dark pretty quick, and there were lights below us, and all of a sudden there weren't any lights, and we were over northern Canada, and uh, then there was absolutely nothing, and then it was the next morning over Europe. Wow. When I flew back from Oslo, uh, we went over Greenland, uh, and I left in the middle of the night. We flew over Greenland, and the sun came up. And then we kept flying, and the sun went back down. <laughs> I mean, uh -huh. the sun itself didn't come up. It, actually, you got that morning glow. I could see the ice in Greenland. It was gorgeous uh, from 37,000 feet. And then... Uh, it went down again into blackness again uh, and it was because of course we were going over the pole region close to the pole and so we could see the sun peeking through from the other side of the world um, yeah take that flat earthers <laughs> I know when we came back from Germany uh, we left in the morning and uh, it was daylight all the way they as I said you know uh, when you fly east to west uh, mm -hmm. between uh, Europe and U.S. It's just like a really long day. Yeah. And we flew right over the southern tip of Greenland. Yeah. That was interesting. I Only enjoyed... I saw that. I enjoyed flying over Greenland. Uh, I was looking for, you know, hoping to see some northern lights uh, from the aircraft. Uh, but the trouble was it was an A380. It was a double-decker. And I was looking forward to flying on the A380. I had never flown on an A380. I had a window seat. I was all set. And when I sat down in my my chair at the window, uh, I was a full 18 inches from the wall of the aircraft, even though I was the last seat in that row. And then there was a large plastic cover, you know, that is, you know, transparent sheet uh, like they have on the windows. And then the window itself was in a deep well further out. And it was literally half the size of a normal airplane window. You couldn't even see out of it. Mm. So it was like, what a complete waste of time. I'd never, I'll never fly on one of those A380 craft again. They're a piece of junk. I think they're taking them out of service. Well, it can't be too soon. Um, but anyway, I want to say... I, when ahead. I flew, it was a Delta L-1011, a Lockheed Delta oh, 1011. Geez, yeah. And... Coming back, I was in the very back row, and I had a window seat. It was great. Uh, I had a great view, uh, you know, outside and below me, and yeah. uh, a glory followed followed us all the way across the Atlantic. It was really cool. Mm -hmm. That's the sun was in just the right spot for you. Yep. And if you looked really close, a glory is like a circular rainbow, folks. Uh, it's opposite the sun in the sky. It was down below us, and. Uh, if you looked really close, you can see the shadow of the airplane in the very center of the glory. Well, that's what makes the glory is the shadow of the airplane. Um, yeah. And do you know that science doesn't really have the ability to fully explain what a glory is? They know that uh, it's an optical effect caused by the shadow of the obstruction in front of the sun. But they can't explain certain aspects of the glory, which I thought was really interesting. I want to take a moment to say hi to Cyclone and Uberku. Cyclone was the first one here. No, oh, Cosmic Ray was the first one here. I'm sorry. Yeah, so he was the first one here. Good to see you. Uh, we also have Donald Kunzer with us. Creeptasia is joining us again. Hi, Creeptasia. I met you first yesterday online. Uh, and um, this Daryl guy keeps showing up. Alex Bronze is with us. And Renee Cruz. How are you, Renee? Nice to see you. On the hottest 77, that's Bonnie is with us tonight. Um, and we have Alpha Centauri Virgo with us. Nice to see you as well. Cindy Murphy um, and Simon Thompson from Australia. And um, Simon, did you answer my question about Tim Tams? I'm guessing you probably have. Um, Robin, hello. Robert Waters, good to see you. <laughs> the Guano Nebula, I like that. The bell's uh, here. Isabella's with us. Thank you, Isabella. Good. Good to see you. Um, and thank you, Cindy Murphy, for your rapid deletion of those uh, bots. Hey there, Alex uh, Bronze. I think I said hi to you, but Asher Rael, how are you? Nice to see you as well. Um, PG is with us. That's Petita in Pennsylvania. CND Boy is with us. 
And uh, we have, um, that's it so far. So tonight is the peak of these uh, meteors. Hopefully we'll see a lot of them. Also look for areas in the sky that just do flashes. I'll tell you why, because flashes are interesting. Flashes could be meteors that are coming right at us. So all you see is this subtle increase in brightness, and then a big bright thing, and then it goes away. That could be uh, the actual meteor coming at you. Uh, I've seen a bunch of those. Uh, if you know where, you, if you get yep. what you're looking at, you'll see them. Me too. Yeah. I've heard people say they thought they saw a star, you know, wink out or blow up, and then, uh -huh. you know go away and what they're seeing was a meteor coming straight at them that's right now when we say straight at you uh the chances of it hitting you are of course vanishingly small but uh it could still be something that uh, you want to um look at and watch you know because um, some people if they coming at you the chances that they might hit near you are better than if you see it in the sky going overhead you know but still they're really it's pretty vanishingly small oh yeah it's you know you're talking like 60 70 miles away yeah when you see it so yeah and when, uh, it, when it's coming at you when you see it wink out it's still going to be many tens of miles away from you it's not right near right. you so the chances of it falling near you are very small but if it's big enough it might make the distance, and you might, you might have it hit uh, nearby, maybe hit in your state, something like that. In '98, when I saw the uh, Roman, Roman candle uh, meteor shower, mm -hmm. the Leonid, uh, <clears throat> uh, the, the sickle of Leo came up, and uh, they were coming straight out of the radiant. Uh, so many meteor shower, I've seen so many do that, mm -hmm. and there was that one I saw. It was coming straight toward me. And it was, it looked almost fake. It was so cool. Wow. Uh, I could see that the thing was sort of moving around as it came toward me, you know, yeah. like an air current or whatever. But uh, obviously it was very far away. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Wow. Yeah, so uh, here you can see uh, this star here that you're looking at right there. That is the brightest star in the constellation of Leo. Um, and so that's Regulus. And then the sickle of Leo goes right like this. To see uh, more of what that looks like, let me actually let me show you a little better. Um, so watch it just a second here. I will bring it up. Okay, this is our planetarium program. This is the view right now from here, all right? And this is the constellation of uh, Leo right here, okay? That's Leo, the lion. There's the lion, okay? And uh, right there, and uh, we're talking here, of course. So there's uh, Leo, the lion. The radiant for these meteors is right inside this sickle, okay? So we have this star here, okay? Um, uh, let me see here. Um, oops, sorry. Um, Some people say Regulus is the lion's front foot. It always looks like the lion's heart to me. And the artwork kind of corresponds with that, too. Yeah. But the sickle is the lion's mane. Yep. And he's sort of facing toward uh, Orion. And yeah. Indeed. Now, uh, one thing I want to do here, and just to make sure that we're good here, I, don't, I see what's going on. Okay, we have a, a tiny little thing here. I gotta just do this, kind of line it up a little bit. There we go. Okay, so uh, here is Regulus, okay? And this is our horizon right now here. And uh, it, it does look like this. So there's Regulus right there. We don't get the benefit of constellation lines here. So Regulus is here. Let me see if 
I can move that up a little bit. Let me just do that here. That's a sec. So I can move it up a little bit. Okay. Alright, so here is Regulus right here. And here is that sickle in Regulus. So it shows you the reality of being able to see uh, you know, the chart versus reality. So here's the chart. Okay, we don't have the benefit of these. So we see Regulus down here. That's the Alpha Leonis, the, the brightest star in Leo. And then we see this, uh, these stars, one, two, three, four, five. And that's the backward sickle of Leo. The back end of Leo is down here, still the rise, right? Because, of course, the constellation goes out off the view. It's into the ground still. Uh, but we're looking in the middle of that sickle. And for a measurement of what we're talking about, we're talking about in here. Because here is the sickle, right? There's Regulus. comes up, goes back and around. It's like a backwards question mark right there. And right in here, this is where we're looking. All right, that's where we're looking. <clears throat> and yeah. uh, we have the ability to enhance uh, quite significantly so we can see the faint ones. Uh, right now I'm using an ISO or sensitivity of 20,000 uh, for the camera right now. And uh, most cameras go to 8,000. And if I drop this down, I'll show you what that looks like. This is, uh, this right here is 8,000. Uh, and if we take a uh, photograph, right, we can actually do that as well. So let's do that. Um, I'm going to go to a uh, 13th of a second at 8,000. And if we take a photograph, I got to stop this here. Take a photograph of this. Uh, then um, the photo will show up. Um, and let me just bring it up just to show you okay so that's that's the photo right now All right if we go back and I increase our sensitivity to say 25,600 and take the photo at a thirteenth of a second then we'll see uh, we'll see more stars right and again if I increase that to and this is live this is still live and if I even go longer uh, let's say I go to say one and a half seconds or 1.3 seconds 1.6 seconds let's do 1.6 seconds and I take that picture now at 25,600 and we go check it out well now look now we have even more stars in our round field here. So that's, uh, that's pretty interesting. That's how this, uh, this system works. But we're actually going to be showing it constantly at a nice uh, resolution like this so we'll be able to see it. Make sure that you're set to 1080p. All right, 1080p, 1080p in your YouTube uh, broadcast. So you'll be able to see this the way you should see it. And when you see a Leonid meteor, uh, it can appear anywhere in the sky. It's just, uh, say you saw a meteor halfway across the sky. But if you trace its direction of motion back to that radiant point, that's how you know it's a Leonid shower meteor. Right. It doesn't and have to be in Leo over here. That's the radiant. Yeah. It could be like out here, and it could be a line going, you know. Um, so that isn't, that isn't. Uh... Now, I have noted in years past, as I said earlier, that uh, uh, Leo more than, or the Leonids more than other showers perhaps I've seen, uh, can concentrate toward the radiant point. Mm -hmm. But uh Anywhere in the sky, if you can trace it back toward the radiant point, it's a Leonid. Otherwise, it's just a random meteor, mm -hmm. which isn't unusual to see either. There's a name for that, but I forget what it is off yet. Yeah. All right. 
And by the way, uh, just to get proper language, this is the SkyTour Livestream East Cam uh, that we're looking at right now. Uh, the SkyTour Livestream East Observatory is being rebuilt and uh, we're using a whole different process. We did have a dome out front and you see the dome actually um, when we, uh, whenever, you, whenever we show you the startup screen here, you see the dome. All right, and that dome is gone. We actually got rid of it because we outgrew it. Um, I need more room because I have more equipment. And so we're actually uh, building another building out front and it's gonna use linear actuators to lift the roof right up off the building and put it down to the side instead of using a dome at all. Uh, dome is problematic. Uh, the shutters on the dome, which are the openings, got ripped off four times during the last winter that we had had it. So I had it, no more. So uh, yeah. we're, we're doing a building that's gonna be very robust and with a roof that uh, can support 1,200 pounds of uh, weight on it. Domes look like observatories. They do. That's what's cool about them. Yep. Uh, my neighbor across the street uh, back over 20 years ago, mm -hmm. uh, he got me into computers and I got him into astronomy. And he actually, he bought my old Celestron. Uh, he built an observatory. He had a 10 inch bead. He got a 10 inch bead and he built an observatory and it was just like your roll off roof out in Arizona. It, uh, it had, his had a conventional peak roof on it, but you'd see the thing. It looked like a giant doghouse more than anything. Yeah. The roof of the Arizona one is, it looks flat, but it's not. It's actually sloped to allow water to run off. Uh, and built into the roof is a cooling system. There's a, uh, a cooler in the roof so that if the temperature inside gets above a certain temperature, the air inside gets evacuated uh, and, and cooler air replaces it. It's not an air conditioning system. You can't air condition a building with a telescope in it, you know, but that's okay. Hello there, Echo. That's where we're having a fun, safe time here. Um, talking science, astronomy, meteorology, meteorites, uh, deep sky. Yeah, Isabella says in the winter the domes look like igloos. Yeah, they do. And my dome was entirely white. But for Halloween, um, it had a remarkable resemblance to Stuart the Minion from Despicable Me. So I dressed it up as Stuart the Minion. Um, and, you know, people were enjoying that. They thought it was hilarious. I thought it was I, funny. I thought about building a, an observatory dome out east of here, uh, about 70 miles east of here. It's a tiny little town called Carvel, Colorado. Yeah. And uh, I had some nice visits out there, and it looked like a great place to put an observatory, but uh, if I had put a dome out there, I, I figured it would look like a good... Uh, target practice for the Yahoo local summit out there. <laughs> yeah, and that's that's precisely one of the reasons why I uh, opted to get away from domes for the West Coast Observatory. Yeah. Um, as we speak, uh, one of our SkyTour livestream people, Marianne Robb, is actually down in another town in southeastern uh, Arizona scouting a new location. She's actually seen several locations just today. Uh, for a new building and a new telescope um, and uh, it would work in concert with everything else and if it's active you can have the other ones active at the same time um, so that's the nice thing we can run all these telescopes all at the same time and just coordinate all their activities through the broadcast software that does everything you see on the screen before you um, so we can have several telescopes well we're doing that right now, aren't we? Because, uh, in fact, right now, okay, uh, we do have, um, let's see, uh, uh, right now we do have, for instance, let's see, we'll go back to this. All right, we do have the West Coast uh, camera. That's the West Coast camera feed. Daryl, you don't see it, but they do. Uh, it's on the broadcast feed. And this is the all-sky camera out there right now. 
uh, that you can see the Milky Way uh, going through the middle of the picture, uh, and Jupiter is the bright thing at the top there, on the, just to west the left. coast. You know, it's, Arizona. It's, San, it's not the west coast. Yeah, it's close. Enough. Unless the San Andreas Fault finally let go. You didn't hear that? Happened today. Where were you? Oh, okay. No. Probably sleeping, taking no. a nap. Yeah, no. So there you go. So that's that. So we're going to be able to switch to that once in a while just to see, because that's actively taking 12 second pictures and stacking them up. Uh, and we'll see. Like it just one, one just came in now, and you saw this cloud move a little bit at the very top right. Um, so, um, so there we go. And uh, we don't want to miss anything, that's for sure. So we'll make sure that we don't miss anything. So here is our live view. Okay. You see the stars in the sickle already much more prominent. There they are. Rising a little bit. There's Regulus. And then one, two, three, four. And then they're getting there. Uh, this location has more light pollution than the west, western United States location. And the other uh, western United States location that's going to be in a different location is actually darker than the one we have now out there. Um, that's going to be like a Bortle 1 to 2, Daryl, just so you know. Wow. Uh, yeah, it's in the deep blue of Why Bortle. not just move the observatory down there? Yeah, why not just? <laughs> well, you know, it's a less infrastructure to have to support. Well, if you think about it, uh, what are we going to do for power? Uh, we have to have Starlink. Um, we're going to have to have power. We're going to have to have water on site. Right now, there's no water at this location we're talking about. Um, but we'll get there. We can do it. You know, I know that people... Uh, where we are now, they actually use the landowner's water on a daily basis. They come fill up their water tanks, and they have a water tank that they use for everything. Yeah. If that well ever runs dry, it's going to put quite a few people out of uh, water. Not a good thing in the desert. It's a story repeated all over the West. That's a problem here. Yeah. Hey, Prow, how you doing? So once again, uh, we're again looking at the Leonid meteor shower. Uh, the peak is not going to be uh, for a uh, like an hour or so. It's 12:18. Peak will start in roughly an hour, a little less. Uh, I think I saw something right here just now. Did you guys see that? Not me. Or was that a phosphine in my eye? I can't tell. Um, but uh, that's when the peak should be. It doesn't mean that's when that that's exactly when it's going to be. It could actually be coming up in the next five minutes. You know. Uh, and, the yeah. The official peak was actually last night. Uh, what they're saying tonight is uh, some scientists crunched some numbers and they say that the Earth may intersect a stream. From the comet's 1733 passage, I think it was something mm -hmm. like that, and uh, they think there may be several hundred meteors an hour. I think they're calling it a surge, and uh, uh, we may see a sudden outburst of uh, hundreds of meteors. Love to see that. So we're we we're streaming just in case it happens, and yeah. we'll be recording it. Hello, Pamela Strutman. How are you? Nice to see you. Robert Waters says uh, he had a student with ADHD in a class he taught a few years ago who climbed out on the lid of one of our domes and sat on it. <laughs> wow. Well, I guess, uh, I guess it kept him busy. That's good. Yeah, you're looking at Bill's stream. That's cool. You know, Bill has to work till 1 a.m. Eastern time tonight, so... Yeah, so he's okay. You know, he's got his camera going, but he's playing the KJRA programs. Oh, yeah? Is he playing us? Is he playing any of ours? I don't know. 
I he was live earlier. I, I assume he's still alive. Oh, okay. Live program. Yeah. I wanted to thank Robin Curtis for reminding me about the letters I had up here that I needed to take down. Uh, these are correct. Up there. That's fine. Robin, you asked what time does the moon come up tonight? Uh, 1 a.m. or later. It's a day or two past uh, third quarter. Yeah, so we're, we're on the flip side of the moon's cycle. And uh, who knows, starting tomorrow, it's actually a little bit cloudy for us right now. Okay, so if we look out west, okay, um... If we look out west, let me, uh, here we go. Okay, this is our live view for the last 12 seconds. And uh, we have some clouds in the sky. We would choose not to stream on a night like this. Just so you know. Notice, I guess the moon, moon's about two days past yeah. third quarter. The moon is due to rise about 1 a.m. Uh, here. And as a general thing, I'd say... You know, the moon is going to rise about 1 a.m. there also. I don't remember the name of the town you were in in Connecticut, or I'd look it up. Terryville. Terryville. Hey, uh, Prow. Uh, Prow says, uh, is that a satellite? Uh, these are our... Uh, this, these are our grids. So if you... Uh, let me just... Here we go. We're going to make this grid this color... Alright, so grid 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. If you see something in one of those grids, let me know. So what grid was the satellite in that you might have seen? And while we're waiting for that, I'll say hi to Dan Norton. How you guys doing? How are you doing? Uh, it might be, uh, let's see, he says, uh, yeah, any more likely to see meteors tonight from San Diego? Well, uh, Daryl just suggested that uh, some meteor folks crunched some numbers and said there might be a surge tonight. And that's possible. And the surge would be between 1 and 1, 1 a.m. and 2 a.m. basically in the hour. East, Eastern time. Right. And that's, 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 oh, sorry. I'm, I'm, I, I run everything in Eastern time. Yeah. Just like the radio show, everything's in Eastern time. So yeah, uh, so it'd be like between 1 and 2 a.m. Eastern um, that we might see something, which is why we're streaming. Okay, it's 12.23, so we, you know, it could be any time now. But again, this is the radiant right here. This is Regulus in Leo, and this is the backwards sickle of the front end of Leo's mane, basically. And the radiant is inside here, which means that any meteors, which could be all the way out here, they might be appearing to originate from that location, but they could be out here. You can see one here that goes that way. And, you know, that would be, the, but that could be one, if you draw a line through it, it goes back toward the main, this area in Leo the Lion. Uh, moon rises at 1237 AM in Terryville, Connecticut. All right. And, uh, per the guy who asked about, uh, San Diego. Uh, uh, let me look again. Uh, Dan Norton, hi. Uh, Dan, if the uh, meteor surge happens tonight, is scheduled uh, 1, one thirty or so Eastern time, uh, you will not see that at all because uh, Leo is still going to be at hori below your horizon at that time. Now, uh, you won't see any meteors until Leo rises, which is about midnight, your local time. Uh, after that, it's worth looking, and you may still see something. Yeah, but if you're watching us, you'll see what we see, because we can see it. Yes. I want to answer Ghostfish's message, uh, our question. He says, where's your camera located? Uh, this camera is located on our Skythro Livestream East property out in Connecticut on the East Coast. And uh, we have a, a reasonably 
good sky. Um, you know, I'm I sure am, you know, doing some uh, brightening of it with the uh, with the uh, ISO, the uh, sensitivity of the sensor. Um, and that's one camera. The other camera we have uh, is this one. This is the uh, all sky camera. And that's 2,500 miles away out in Arizona uh, at our Sky Tour Livestream West location. And uh, we have very dark skies out there. This is a very sensitive camera, so it's picking up the very, very faint light of Phoenix almost 70 miles away uh, in the east, which is to the upper right here. So that's pretty cool. And uh, when we take photos, it just looks gorgeous. Living in the 21st century. Yeah, I mean, my goal is to be able to use telescopes all over the world uh, that we put in, and uh, we have two now, one here in Connecticut. Uh, we're rebuilding this telescope observatory, by the way, because uh, it would have been done already if wood wasn't so damn expensive. Um, and we got the one out in the desert built, and we have a third one going in out in the desert in Arizona as well. Uh, we're not sure of the location yet, but we want to we want to do it in a different location. Um, that way, it's not subject to like the clouds you saw in the All Sky Cam just now. Uh, the weather is different wherever you go, and we don't have a Southern Hemisphere Observatory yet. We're still looking for a Southern Hemisphere location. Um, Simon. Well, I would love to have an Australian. James Dugan? Is James yeah. here yet? I don't see him here yet. Hey, Mad Butcher, how you doing? Yeah. I've never seen the southern sky. I'd love to. Me either. I imagine I will get fixated on and take many pictures of the Magellanic Clouds. Oh, yeah. I will have more pictures of the Eta Carina Nebula than you could ever imagine. Well, if you ever got down there, you might not want to come back. Oh, if I'm using my telescope from here. Oh, shucks, i got to go down and work on my telescope. Yeah, it's, it's only a 22-hour flight. <laughs> yeah. 22-hour flight, you lose a day, and your body is messed up for a week. If you're going down there, you got to spend a month, because if you're going to go down there for a week, you're not going to ever enjoy it. Unless you totally adapt to an Australian time frame while you're still here you know it's not as Something bad on the west halfway coast halfway around the world yeah, it's not as bad if you're on the west coast it's worse if you're on the east coast well, that's right Dan Norton says you do have a good view with your telescope yeah we do um, I, 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 I did that site survey for an observatory almost five six years ago no more than that eight years ago and I knew that we we're going to put one in there. Uh, I didn't know how I was going to do it or when I was going to do it, uh, but I knew that it was going to go out there. And the, the landowners were very, very, very generous and said, you can put a telescope on our property in a building. Uh, you can use our power. Uh, the power is green. It's a totally green observatory. It's all by the power of the sun. Uh, so we have uh, there's solar panels out there that the landowner owns that he has. Uh, and they provide all the power for our observatory, the computers, everything. Um, and uh, we bought Starlink for the property. And, I mean, as a small token of our appreciation, we take care of the Starlink costs for him and his wife. So we cover Starlink, uh, and they share with us their property, which is very nice. So, pretty cool. I've only seen maybe two questionable meteors, and they could have been just figments of my eyes. Nothing yet. So it could be, I don't know, it could be that this year is another bust. But you never know. I'll increase the sensitivity a notch, go to 25,600. So if they're really faint, we'll see them. Dan Norton says, technology is grand. 
until it breaks. Yeah, like, well, we had that happen. This the, the Arizona telescope had a uh, a fatal error uh, in one of its uh, motherboards in the telescope, and luckily the SkyTour live stream people that are in our organization went out to the desert, uh, and that's protected land. So just you can't just go out to the desert. You've got to go out and you've got to get permission to go on the property, um, and uh, the the people see every move you're making because they've got dozens literally of security cameras on the property they can see everything you do uh and it's actually comforting to know that they can because it means that no one else can come on that property sneak on and try and do anything without being fully um you know caught on tape and camera so that's that's actually a comforting thing you make me think of uh uh, Michael Gross and uh, Reba McIntyre in the movie Tremors. Oh, yeah. Remember that? Yeah. Yeah. Tremors was a funny movie. Most heavily armed people in the county, probably. Oh, yeah. Well, that that's also true of this. I mean, uh, let, let's put it this way. These people could certainly survive a Tremors attack. I promise you. Ghost fish is talking about uh, having seen some uh, Leonids. I'd love uh, to have seen the 96 uh, six storm. Yeah, he, he was nine when he saw that. And uh, he said it was really memorable. And then some long burners. Long burners have uh, basically earth grazers that go all the way across the sky. Um, he said he saw that from uh, uh, Chattanooga. Well, wow. hello there, Night for 456 Gaming. How are you? He says it would be nice if you had a telescope in Puerto Rico. The skies over there are really open. I'd have to look and see what the light pollution factors are in Puerto Rico. Uh, I know that we need to, uh, we definitely need to uh, make sure that we're in a very, very dark sky. If we're not in a dark sky, um, then it's not worth putting a telescope in. You know, with like a radio telescope, you don't need a dark sky. Um, you know, I don't know about Arecibo's light pollution. Uh, Arecibo's in the mountains, but I think there was light pollution there. I gotta look and see. Xanarex with us. How you doing? Radio telescope, you don't need night at all. <laughs> well, I agree. Yeah, of course. But, uh, you know, we're talking about a telescope at night. Um, oh, yeah. So, yeah, you, you, you certainly don't care because day or night. I, I made a radio telescope um, when I was working as a science teacher at a science center. And um, I did it with uh, another astronomer on the mountain. And uh, we listened to the moon of Jupiter, Io, as it moved around Jupiter. We could actually hear it and plot the... Uh, sound uh, that was interpolated from the signal uh, into a, a, a chart recorder and we could actually see uh, what was called the sodium torus, the actual sodium atoms in the exosphere of the area around Io. Yeah. Um, and as Io would go around the backside of Jupiter, you know, of course we couldn't see it, but when it did that, what would happen is that that those atoms that went up into the uh, area, you know, the, the atmosphere, if you will, around Io that made this artificial atmosphere, they rained out like snow onto the ground and became like frost. And so on the backside of Jupiter, Io has no atmosphere. When it comes around Jupiter and starts warming up again, those particles sublimate and go back up into the, uh, and, and make an atmosphere of sorts around, a very tenuous atmosphere around Io. And uh, that there's also radio signals associated with those transitions that the atoms are making. And we heard them. And we could see uh, how our chart recorder could see the increase in the 
and the atoms around uh, Io during the daylight hours. And, you know, and you'd see it in decline when it comes out from behind Jupiter, and then it would start to climb. Very, very enlightening. It's amazing how you, what you could get from what a simple uh, printout. Oh, well, see more planes here. That must be a regular flight path. It is. It's the international birds. Yeah. You know, these are all the overseas flights. Did I, I just saw a streak right here. I'm not sure what I saw. Hey, Saren Man, how you doing? Thank you. That's awful nice of you. Thank you, Saren Man. And Alice Pooper, how are you? Oops. Would you excuse me a moment, please? Yeah. Right back. Sure. All right. So this plane is going to fly right through the radiant of these meteors. Okay, this is Regulus. And the radiant is right here. So it's a little below it. Isn't that cool? This, this is the, so anywhere in the sky, we're going to see them. We're going to find out if they're if they're, real, they're right. It's it's 12:37 a.m. Eastern time. So we'll see if they're correct. And then we're going to do the same thing we did the other night. We're going to go right to uh, uh, an automated stream and we'll let this go. Well, we're going to leave this stream up. We're not going to uh, double it up with. Uh, uh, this guy here which is that one you know, look and see the clouds now now the clouds are fully enveloping out in Arizona it's actually very rare that we get clouds out there that we have over 300 clear nights a year out there um, but that's all right And Saren Man, I wanted to thank you, and as I mentioned, but I also wanted to welcome you to the stream. Um, the meteor stream is just one of many. It's very rare that we do a meteor stream. Um, I scrambled to get our, our East Coast camera up and running to get this stream uh, published like this. But if you uh, want, um, if you join us and, and you know subscribe and like us, uh, you'll find that we have over... I couldn't believe it, but we have over 400 streams out there already that we've done um, of between two and six hours long uh, on the night sky, the deep night sky, from our automation, our automated observatory out in uh, out there, um, and that's pretty cool. You know, it's amazing because we spent a lot of time uh, being able to do this from there and or do it from here. Um, I'm actually using a remote system to control the, the camera here. Uh, I'm in my bunker, okay, my control room, and I'm controlling the camera there. I'm also controlling the camera out in the uh, Arizona desert, which is this guy here. That's the all sky camera. And uh, the telescope itself out there, that's uh, a different story. The telescope out there, uh, if you haven't seen it before, I will show you what that looks like because I know you haven't seen it. Um, but this, uh, I will show you the security cameras, actually. So these are the security cameras in the building, just so you can see them. Uh, they're right here. So this right here, this is our main scope. The roof is closed right now in the building. And this is actually the uh, computer uh, handset that controls the telescope. We use this just as a visual reference. 
Uh, but we this is just a security camera, and we're installing one that actually is a pan pan and tilt mount with infrared systems. Um, so that's that's coming. All right, and uh, so that's pretty cool. And then we have this image here, which is just our our uh, all sky cam, which I mentioned to you before. And back to our uh, wonderful, uh, back to our wonderful uh, view of our night sky here. Let me. Uh, So you can see, as I said, you can see uh, Leo's uh, brightest star there, Regulus. Okay, that's uh, right here, Regulus. And this is the sickle of Leo right here going around. And then the radiant is right in here. So all meteors will point back to that radiant if they're going to be a Leonid meteor. All right, and Daryl, I know you couldn't see that, but that's... It was there for the broadcast. Okay, so let's do this. Okay, and then let's do that. There we go. Oh no, not that. Let's do this. There we go. So Leo's rising. Leo's arising. <laughs> what was that planet supposed to be called? Seda Reticuli? That whole story. Oh, yeah. Uh, that was where. That was the star map. Was that uh, Betty and Barney Hill's star map? Uh, no, that was. Uh, aliens supposedly took uh, humans to their home planet uh, around Zeta Reticuli. Oh, was that the. Uh, the uh, it has a name. I don't remember. Yeah, Serpo. Uh, yeah. Serpo. Was that it? That sounds familiar. Project Serpo, which I think is really, um, I, I, I can't buy that. That see, when people talk about such incredible numbers of secrets they have to keep, I, I just, it just, it doesn't work. Humans are not that good at keeping secrets. Hmm. I mentioned that on a KGRA stream one night, and they all laughed at me. Well, I figured maybe I would like K KGRA host would. Yeah, Brian but Devore talked about Zeta Reticulum. Yeah, no, he said the Zeta Reticulum is throwing rocks at us again. <laughs> That's funny. Hi, Ryan. By the way, good to see you. You've been here before. Saren Man says he grew up in Brooklyn, New York, and light pollution was awful. Yeah, uh, Brooklyn, New York, you're right in the red zone, man. That, that's as that's as bad as it can get. It might even be like a white zone when it comes to, a, you know, a Bortle level. But it's very, very bright there. Very, very bright. Saren, man, uh, Earth is passing through uh, the orbital path of the comet Temple Tuttle. And uh, where it has left uh, cosmic debris in its wake from previous passes of the comet, uh, when Earth intersects the comet's orbit, uh, that's when meteor showers happen. Yeah. <clears throat> Asher says he lives in Washington State, so he gets 65 clear days a year. <laughs> I'm really sorry to hear that, man. That's just... I know you said that earlier, but that's just... Uh, I don't think I could handle that. That's like, why would you put an observatory in England anywhere? There's very little clear sky over there. Same thing in Ireland and Scotland. Why Why do people have observatories there? You know? Yeah. Uh, let's see. Cosmic Ray says there's even videos of Mark's shipboard office stored out there. Where are you talking? Stored out where? I do I do have an office like that that has portholes for windows, yes. 
Um, I worked for the Navy uh, doing model work um, during the day. And, uh, you know, but I am a professional astronomer, so that's, uh, I guess they found the value in that talent too. But um, I do have an office that does have, uh, uh, it looks like a ship, yes. It looks like a battleship compartment, indeed. It's got a hatch for a door. You turn the hatch and come in. Um, the town wouldn't let me do uh, an actual hatch. I could have had an actual hatch for a door. Oh, I wanted that. But, um, no, it's against code. You can't do it. Oh, well, boy, what do they do on ships? <laughs> I know. Different, different problem. So, cool. Uh, Ghost57, Ghostfish says... Chattanooga skies are clearing up. Looking almost straight up, I see the Seven Sisters and a bright yellow star, perhaps Venus? Mars. Yeah, well, it's probably Mars, yeah. Venus is lost in the sunset. Yeah, to the right south, now. about 45 degrees is Orion. I wonder how similar your view may be. I'm guessing he says, well, yeah, um, my view is not... Uh, not the same. My view's a little better, probably, because I don't have city skies. Uh, as you can see, we see some of the stars. Um, but here's what I'll do, just to give you an idea. Uh, I'm going to take this off for a minute. I'm going to increase my exposure to, say, two seconds at 20,000. I'll take a photograph. All right, so I just took a photograph of the sky. For two star, two seconds. Okay, that's four seconds. All right. Well, if you look, you can see all the stars in the sky here. That that's actually you can't see those not yet. Uh, just a minute. See the beehive cluster right in the middle. Yeah. Right above center. Yeah, that's right here. That's in Cancer. This this is the number of stars I can see. Uh, it's a little bit too much exposure. If I actually come back to this and. Uh, let's take this down to say uh, one second, 1.3 seconds. Let's try that and then go back to that. All right, so I take the photograph. Now you can see a little more. You can see better. Um, in fact, we come down here near the bottom and you can see uh, Regulus and the backward sickle of Leo here. Okay, and this is the radiant is right here. And right above this, where Daryl is pointing out, like right here, this is the beehive cluster in the constellation Cancer. This is Gemini, Castor, and Pollux right here, and this is the Gemini twins. Just out of view is Measure 35. It's a beautiful cluster. Um, and Orion is off here to the side. You can't see it. All right, but that's uh, that's the sky. It's not that bad, actually. It's quite nice. So let's go back now to our nighttime view. Right, right star, uh, a little above your pointer right now. That's Procyon. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Sirius is okay. out of view. Hello, James Dugan. James, how you doing? Hey, James, guess what I got here? I have Tim Tams. In fact, hold on a sec. Hold on. I'll be right back. James was bragging about Tim Tams the other night. All right. All right, James, look. I'm going to show you something. Nothing you haven't seen before, actually. But something that 
I think it's pretty cool. All right, so I'm going to show you my background here. Yeah. Hey, look what I got right here, eh? Look at that. Tim Tams. That's right. In fact, I've got the chocolate ones. They're just so good. Like that, eh? Mmm. Oh, yeah. I live on these things. Now you got the good stuff, he says. <laughs> well. Those aren't Tim Tams. Those are Smat Smith. I saw the package. <laughs> yeah, they're, I'm sorry about it being backwards. Uh, but yeah, they're, they're Tim Tams. Mm, yeah. Smat Smith. <laughs> In fact, if, um, if I whip this around the right way, then you can see it. Tim Tam. That's a re. Tim Tam. You gotta love these things. They're, 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 no, you don't, they're, they're terrible for you. But you know what? I love them. They're so good. Yep. Whoa, good one. Uh, you'd call it Zone 6. I don't see your time clock, but uh, 1051 or so. Okay. And it was a lead in it. You finally saw one. Finally. Hello, Hedrick. Anybody mm -hmm. else see that? It was a really good one. It was, uh, uh, if Mark is going to buy a nine grid square, it was over at about zone six, right hand side, and uh, it was moving right from the radiant through maybe mm -hmm. five into six, and it was kind of a gold color, it looked like. It's like this? Yes, exactly. Right. Ubercoo saw it. Robin Curtis says 531 30, or 5137-ish. Zone 6. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Well, we'll be looking for, for that on replay. Thank you, Robin, for noting it for us. Yeah, I don't see your... your, uh, your you don't clock. see the time. Yeah, that's, that's only in the broadcast software. I'm sharing my screen with you, so you don't see it. I should be sharing if, the other screen. I mean, if you hadn't been eating Tim Tams, you would have seen it probably. Well, here's what they see. Well, that's not quite what they see. Um, yeah. Isabella saw it. I thought that was a pretty good meteor. Well, these are our zones one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Why do you do nine zones? Because it does it automatically. Oh. Yeah. Siobhan Cox saw it. Well, hey, Siobhan. Haven't seen you before. Thank you for coming in. Yes, Robin. Yeah, I was focused like a laser on the screen, so I got to see it. I was eating Australian cookies. <laughs> Smat Smith. You mean biscuits? Biscuits, whatever. Actually, James and Simon, these Tim Tams were given to me tonight by an Aussie. Um... I went axe throwing tonight uh. with an Aussie woman. Um, we went out with them, and it was kind of really fun. And um, she was pretty good at it. Actually, a little frighteningly good at it. So I'm not sure I like her anymore. Um, she's a nice person. I won't throw axes with her anymore, though. But we all had a good time. <laughs> Axe throwing seems to be a falter of thing nowadays. I'll tell you one thing. You certainly get your arms in shape doing that. Uh, Sam, a sh Sam S. says, do you have a replay? Uh, we don't have a replay, but the stream is being recorded. So you can, in fact, 
uh, go back to that time. Uh, Robin put the time in um, up above. Robin Curtis put the time in. And she will be, uh, I'm sure, happy to repeat that for you. And the zone. The zone was uh, in our in our makeup here is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. It was five into six. And uh, she had the time that she put in. I don't keep this up because I don't want to have it interfere. Uh, Mike Hendrick, that was the plane you're looking at right there, I think. Maybe, actually. I'm not sure. Did we see flashing lights on that, or is that actually a satellite? Yeah, I think they're flashing lights. But they're going away. Actually, you know what? I can easily tell. Uh, I'm going to... I'm going to do this. I'm going to get out of this movie mode here. And I'm going to go do a longer exposure. Yeah, it's like it. Yeah, well, I can prove it just by coming down here and taking a two second shot. <clears throat> at 5,000 sensitivity. And then we zoom in on it. And what do we got? Okay, that's too much. Yep, that's an airplane. Well, yeah, it looks like an airplane. Yeah. Right by regulars. Yep. And we'll go back to our our beautiful movie mode here and then increase our sensitivity again. There we go. Hey there, Marco. Well, I'm not convinced it wasn't a satellite yet. I, I saw it blinking, but I wasn't sure. Because this is it right here still, right? That's regular. The one to its lower left is the object. That right oh, there. that right there. Okay, sorry. Yeah, you're right. This is regular. That's the... Okay, so that that's an aircraft then. I do see it blinking, but sometimes the point sources that can be these things and the cameras uh, will look like they're blinking too. I'm just waiting for that one beautiful meteor that leaves a train behind it. We gotta have one of those. <laughs> Mike Hedrick says, the cool thing in my smartphone is I can zoom all the way in. Yeah, but your screen is this big, <laughs> you know. If you could do this on your computer, you may not be able to zoom in, but you'll see it effectively larger the whole time. God, these Tim Tams are too good, man. Ugh. James Dugan, you gotta stop Australia from making these wonderful things. Ugh. I hope you brought enough for everybody. I know, right? Man. You know, everybody is 83 people watching right now. So, this is good. <laughs> uh, Mike says, you have goodies smudged on your zoomed in face? No, I don't. Uh, James Dugan says they're very addictive Mark watch those yeah I know trust me I know I mean they're just Tim Tam is just a and this is a family pack so this is not just like a one or two in a, oh look at that plane coming through or is that a satellite that might be a satellite right there just late at night that bright that has to be a plane I would think so but uh, I have seen some bright satellites it's flashing too. I don't see it flashing. I'm looking right at it. Maybe it is. I am. It's uh, flashing. I mean, it's that same general flight path as all those other ones we saw. This is a plane.
Hey Sherry Hosterman, how are you? Hostess says he has a moon pie. Huh. Wish I had a moon pie. I love those things. Yeah. Well, he's I have. Chat. He's a southern. I have tin I bet tams. he knows about, about RC Cola and moon pie. Mm. That was lunch when I was a kid down south. Wow. Well, I have Tim Tams. All right. I don't have a moon pie, but they're just as good. Hard to beat a moon pie. Yeah. And a RC Cola. I couldn't stand RC Cola. It was just... I couldn't believe it. If it wasn't Coke, I couldn't drink it. You know what I mean? It was, RC Cola was just like a cheap imitation and it tasted funny. It tasted different. Mm -hmm. It's like Tab. It's, uh, my, mother, my mother used to buy Tab. And, and Tab tasted like chemicals. I never understood Tab. And I agree, it tasted like chemicals. Uh, RC Cola was a southern thing. Well, we had it up here. RC Cola and a moon pie was lunch for generations of people down south. Mm -hmm. Uh, Sherry Hausterman says, I remember Tab. <laughs> yeah, remember it was like that pink can that said Tab on it. It's like, wow. <laughs> Shimon Cox is saying, uh, I believe I'm waiting to see here if uh, it's worth bundling up and going outside to see the uh, meteor shower. Well, if we're lucky, we'll see one, and it'll be a beautiful green streak through the sky, and um, it would leave a trail behind it as it burns up in the atmosphere. Yeah, so we'll see what happens. Uh, Mike talks about a, a bolide he saw and probably heard uh, in Oregon. And I know that um, I've seen uh, two good ones like that. No, three. The first was when I was getting out of graduate school one night. It was raining. And I walked out of the building and looked up and it was raining just heavy cloud cover raining and above the cloud cover through the clouds I could see this green fireball going right through the you know, it was of course 90 miles above the clouds or so but I could see this fireball it was so bright that it illuminated the ground from all the way up there and the clouds below and it was just stunning and I was frozen in place when I watched it um, and then uh the second one was in a farm field when I had a telescope up in a farmer's pasture. There were cows all around me. I knew them. They knew me. And I had a telescope out there. And while the cows were sitting there, you know, okay, I'm using the telescope. And all of a sudden, I saw this amazing earth-grazing uh, meteor that actually went from the one horizon to the other. And as it went across the sky when it got to just three quarters of the way through it broke up into three distinct pieces that separated so it was like coming along cohesively and all of a sudden broke into three pieces and a few minutes later I heard boom, 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 you know as it blew up I heard the uh, the explosion uh, that was really stunning and then in Maine uh, with my niece's husband Scott uh, we're in a field looking up and another earth grazer came through. And this one left a nice smoke train behind it like the other one. 
And it was just stunning. It just went right across the sky, leaving a smoke train, which stayed there for quite some time. We had time to trade binoculars back and forth with each other. Look at that, sky! Look at that. Yeah, you, yeah, check it out. Oh, yeah, look at it go. We had time to do that because it was uh, slower moving. It was after midnight, so the meteor was effectively catching up with the Earth. And it was just stunning. So I saw three, if you want to call it that. And hello to Justin Langford, who says, I've seen two meteors in the last two hours. The time I, uh, at the time I had my camera um, taking pics, but the meteorites were out of frame. Go figure. That's always true, isn't it? They're never where you're pointing. Think how disappointed uh, P and K space imaging guys are. You know, these are friends of mine, Paul and Keith, and they were they were streaming the same lunar eclipse I was uh, on uh, January twentieth of twenty nineteen, and um, they, Paul Paul, who was running the telescope down in Miami, just happened to zoom in on a crater. Uh, during the height of the eclipse, so the moon was blood red, just at the right time uh, to miss something we caught, which was a meteor striking the moon. <laughs> so it's like, oh, you know, I don't believe they missed it. But that made us one of five groups on the planet to actually see that happen. Sherry says, it's nice to see that we're all sky watching together since I'm in Iowa. It's too cold to go outside. Well, Sherry, you got to come back when we're doing the deep sky. You should see the nebulae and the clusters of stars that we take photographs of in seconds. No one else is doing what we're doing, Sherry. No one. I I've tried to find other people streaming the deep sky like we're doing it. And after we take the pictures, they go up to a server and they're made available to you from here, from skytourlive.com. You go there and you can see everything. We got our, our link to our database where you can dive down into folders and see pictures right now even if you wanted to of everything we've taken pictures of in the last year. Um, and, uh, and they're made available at full resolution for free uh, to you. So that's something to do. So skytourlive.com, go there. Um, you can also order prints if you like these things. You can get prints of them. Uh, there's people making big metal ones. There's metal canvas framed photos. Ah, it's just, just amazing. Um, one of our Sky Tour people actually has an entire room donated and dedicated just to our work. And there's, there's canvas prints everywhere all over the wall. It really is just fun to go in there and sit down and think, wow, did we do this? <laughs> This is so cool. So Sherry, if uh, you hit the subscribe button and hit the bell, hopefully you'll get notifications of when we're live streaming. Yeah, and when you hit the bell at the drop down, you know, click all notifications. All right. So that's cool. Hello, hello to Heavy Rain and Lost for Words. How are you guys doing? And it's cloudy in Michigan for Lost for Words. Well, I'm at a loss for words for that myself. Sorry to hear that. Justin, it's four degrees Fahrenheit here. Mm. That's minus 15 or so Celsius. It's about 24 degrees here in Connecticut at the moment. Uh, yes, I can point to the radiant again. Uh, sorry about that. It's a question from Michael Hedrick. Okay. All right. This is a Leo down here, okay? This is the star Regulus in Leo. And... The, the, there's this, it goes up to this star here, 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 and here. This is the backwards question mark of Leo, all right. And the radiant is cradled by this main area right here. This is the lion's mane, and there's the radiant. It's right there, and that just means that's not where the meteors are coming from. It means that the meteors can be in a line anywhere from here, you know. So there's one right there. Did you see that? And that was a Leonid. Right there. It, it, it originated from here and went right there. Just as I said that. So, uh... I'd say 110.25 in zone 9. Oops, sorry. 
No, zone 8 to 9. Okay. Thank you, Robin. So that's the radiant right there, and this was definitely a lean it because the way I, it was a radiant, it was a radial like a line coming out from there. <clears throat> well, we're approaching that time. It's one eleven, so uh, we should start to see an uptick in uh, meteorite or meteor uh, activity here. One thing I'd like to add. Um, is that uh, I always wanted to add a meteor radio to the observatory. Haven't done it yet. Know how, but haven't done it. Um, when a meteor comes in, uh, as it comes through the atmosphere, it disrupts terrestrial radio signals from the large antennas. Uh, some of them are in Canada, actually. And... If you're lucky enough to be between those antennas and where the meteor is coming in, uh, you can actually hear the meteor come into the atmosphere. And it sounds like a little whining, shrill sound like, Bzzz! you know, it makes these little uh, high-pitched sounds as they come in. Very, very cool. Um, but unfortunately, there's so few of these terrestrial antennas anymore that... Uh, that technique to listen to meteors is becoming a thing of the past. So. I can't. I don't know what to do about it. AM or FM? AM. Yeah. Okay. This stream will continue all night, by the way. We will continue it all night. Ian Kendall, long time no see. He's not here. Is he? Yeah, I think he just called me Bill. Oh, he's probably bopping between streams. Hey, Mad Cat. Oh, Asher, I'm glad you like the music. 90 in the chat, that's good. I missed Ian Kendall saying hello, where's that? <clears throat> I don't see him. Uh, oh, there he is. Getting up towards the top now. Yeah, I see it, I see it, Ian Kendall. And he says, hi, Bill, hi, Mark. <laughs> And this is Daryl uh, here, Aaron. Uh, Aaron, I called you Aaron. Uh, it's it's Daryl here, uh, Ian, uh, over there that's with me here. I'm Mark. He's Daryl, and his other brother Daryl. Huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. I did have a brother named Larry. Uh huh. Actually, I didn't know his name until you just mentioned it. Yeah. He's just... Say, I'm Larry, and this is my brother Daryl, and my other brother Daryl. Uh -huh. That's all right, Ian. It's really good to see you, though, Ian. I haven't seen you for a long time. Yeah, James says Bill is streaming too. Yeah, I know. Well, that's very nice, Mike Hedrick. Mm-hmm. 
Mike says 93 in chat and climbing. Um, welcome to all. Welcome to the greatest live sky observatory I've found. And we're just doing a meteor stream tonight. When we do the telescope, oh man, that's a whole different story. You know? I suppose because it's in the news, it seems like we get more people for meteors than we do for regular observatory runs. I can see that that's true. Well, let's, um... And eclipses. Yeah. Well, those are the those are the things that people are excited about. But uh, we have a steady rise in attendance with our live observatory feeds, which yeah, has been nice. Well, eclipses and meteor showers, you know, they make the news. And, yeah, they're rare. They're so they're the rare things, you know. More people are watching for it then. Yeah, no doubt. I forget how many we had that night we saw the uh, meteor hit the moon. Oh, I don't. I remember we had uh, almost 5,000 people watching. It was like 4,800 and change when I saw it. Part of the problem is, you know, it's this is sort of at a really bad time, you know, in the night, you know what I mean? To see a real good meteor shower, you need to be in the after midnight time, uh, East Coast, um, for an East Coast shower. And that means minimally you're at 9 p.m. or 10 p.m. or, you know, 8 p.m. prime time elsewhere west in the United States. And then finally you go into the later hours when it's time to go to bed, to go to work tomorrow kind of a thing. Well, yep. maybe not tomorrow because tomorrow is Saturday, isn't it? It's today is Saturday for you. That's true. Still got 43 minutes to go here. Mm -hmm. You have spoken wisely. Yeah, we have 94 people watching. Uh, you guys uh, watching, you know, hit the subscribe button, man. I'd love to have you here and get alerts and, and join us. I'd love to see you join our, our beautiful observatory. Sky Tour live stream right here. There it is. See, it's the probably the only deep sky live observatory in the world um, that does live deep sky. I, I I just haven't seen anybody else doing it. You know, and all you have to do is like and subscribe. All right, hit the thumbs up. Help me uh, with that. Um, and man, I tell you, it's gonna be uh, beautiful. Uh, more people we get because we're adding to the observatory all the time and you know, we already have you know the free data um, you know our server space uh, you know I'm I'm buying all that I'm not charging anybody anything for these pictures um, I just hope the time doesn't come where I can no longer afford to do it right now I can um, you know, hopefully I'll be able to continue to yeah Concert I gray. have seen other live streams. They don't do it nearly as regularly as you do. Yeah, that's correct. There, there is a, um, there's an observatory that does a live stream once every few months, and they only take black and white photos. They don't show color images, not the ones I saw anyway. Um, Chuck's astrophotography, rays, something like that. Yeah. Hey, Ray. R-E-Y. Yeah, I'm waiting on that surge, too. We all are. Okay. This is the star Regulus right here. The Radiant is right here. All right. And we that means it's not, they're not going to be inside there. It means that they can be here. But as long as they draw a line back to uh, that point, that, that area right here, then they are Leonid Meteors. They go all over the sky. 
James, yes, last I heard, Artemis is still going, okay? Yeah, I was just gonna say, yep, Artemis is going fine. They actually uh, did open up a live camera on Artemis, and you could see from Artemis the Earth. It was really pretty. <clears throat> It was a really uh, nice happenstance. I've said before that uh, I think NASA could have done a better job managing their cameras during and after the launch. Uh, there were times I was watching over at Bill's uh, when the launch happened. Uh, we could see on the live feed from NASA at Mission Control, they could see the cameras and they weren't bothering to show it to the viewing audience. Well, there's a difference when you have a private entity who is building uh, a space empire, okay? And so they're going to take advantage of all those types of opportunities to showcase their technology, their data capabilities. But NASA doesn't care about that stuff. That's not their primary mission. Their primary well, mission is to safely launch a rocket and do a mission. But Elon Musk launches a rocket and says, okay, I want people to understand what we're doing technologically. And we're gonna show people what we're doing. NASA doesn't have that mindset. They don't care about that. I don't know about that. I mean. They're just as conscious of, uh, of public relations as SpaceX or anybody. They just don't do it very well. You know, they show the launches and they make a big deal about it. And it's all hoo-ha and PR. And, uh, they don't make a priority of well, doing the they, complete When they were showing these profiles. live shots on mission control, uh, they were having a grand old time watching all the images come back. But they just weren't bothering to show it to the people. As I said. Now, later on, they finally did. They started showing some. I don't know if somebody got the message or what. Hmm. I, it just seemed like piss poor planning to me. I think that they were just hyper-focused on making it launch safely. And to them, it was secondary to actually show pretty pictures. I'm, I'm absolutely certain that's what it was. Because I know for a fact how, how it works with naval projects, too. Um... You know, stuff that isn't secret or top secret. Um, they completely neglect. They take all the great footage and they never see it, you know, for like a week or two. And it has nothing to do with the, trying to hide it. It has to do with the fact that they are focused primarily on pulling it off without a hitch. And then afterwards they say, okay, now that we can breathe a little, you can go show all this cool footage. And that's what NASA does, the same thing. They're not trying to hide anything. They're not missing something that's a conscious decision not to show it because they're focusing on the safety and the proper launch mission profile they want to make sure it all launches right that's how they do that i don't yeah, think we're, they're gonna have to beg to differ on that fine I, you can I differ just, they, okay uh, that's all right well when when we saw them in mission control somebody pulled out bottled bubbly and popped it and they started pouring drinks you know watching the live feed cameras from the uh, spacecraft. Yeah. You know, that... that uh, yeah, none of that negates what I'm saying. Yeah. It actually supports what I'm saying. You know, they were focused on getting the mission to come off without a hitch rather than show pretty pictures. Um, they've always been that way. You know, it's going to take a change in mentality. In fact, it's going to take a SpaceXing <laughs> of NASA to start doing that and I don't think that uh, I don't think NASA wants to do that you know they're not in the in my mind they're not in the business uh, I would guess that movie NASA I would guess NASA quit doing that when they live telecast the Challenger disaster well yeah they're 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 gun shy you know because they don't know how things are going to go um, so they're hyper focused on safety as I've said and and they would rather launch the mission that no one knows about and have it go safely than broadcast a mission that's going to fail in front of millions. I mean, that's but just they what they were do. already broadcasting in front of millions. No, I know, but they weren't broadcasting 
completely because they're a government agency. They don't have the same infrastructure as Elon Musk does. Okay, they actually have less infrastructure for that the pretty end of things, so doing the pretty pictures. They have the cameras, but those cameras were meant to be seen by engineers and so forth to make sure the launch pulled off without a hitch. It doesn't enter their mind to show them for any other reason but to make sure the engineers know what's happening with this particular part of the rocket visually, you know. But to broadcast it, that takes an entirely different group of people to do that. It's a very, very different thing to show an engineering camera to a guy in a monitor at NASA and to broadcast it to the world. That's well, very different. Uh, when they showed the the Orion, the Orion Artemis, whatever craft, with the pretty shot of the Earth in mm -hmm. the background, yep. they knew what they were doing. Well, of course. I mean, by that point, Artemis was in the air, so they could say, "Okay, let's take the liberty of showing these. Let's let's start showing some of these images now and and take advantage of these things." Sure, I I totally buy that, but I don't think I don't think that they did this. Uh, they were going to do this up front when they had so much riding on the line for the very first launch of this type of rocket for this type of mission for the re-entry uh, to space opening up the moon to America once again they weren't going to be focusing on showing pretty pictures to the people watching they were going to focus on getting it safely into space and they did and once it was there then they were able to take the liberty of showing a few shots that's not all the shots they have. They've got plenty more that we haven't seen. Uh, and no, I'm sure there's no UFOs on them and all that kind of thing. That The conspiracy guys will have a, a ball with that, I'm sure. I just think that they did it just to make sure that it pulled off without a hitch, went up safely, and when they could relax, that's when they started to show those things. Isabella has made the point in the past... Uh at the paucity of uh, images from the web that they have shared with the public. Yeah. In, in that case, a lot of that is, you know, there's there are scientific teams out there doing various projects and they're sitting on their data, which is why we don't get to see those images for some time. That's true in some cases. In other cases, you just need to know where to look. Um, I could go find all the images of the Curiosity rover that were taken today and see every single raw image that was taken because you know where to look. I can do the same for Perseverance um, and, and so forth. I can do the same for the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. But again, well, the, the problem is they don't make it very transparent. I'll grant you that. They don't make it very transparent. You know, Daniel H. How you doing? Daniel H. says, "Wasn't it John Glenn who took his own camera to space so he could take pretty pictures?" Was that John Glenn? Do you remember? Uh, no, I do not offhand. All right. <laughs> Mike Hedrick says, "Okay, you got me. Big screen time." <laughs> well. And I like tonight where we're just doing meteor shower. It's the same thing every every minute, you know, except for some crazy music going on in the background. But, um, you know, again, the radiant is right here. We're waiting. There might be some. It seems like um, if, if I had to guess, I'd say that the Leonid meteor shower was probably not a... There is one right there, just as I said that. You see that right there? Yeah, but that wasn't a Leonid. No, it, it was not classically a Leonid because it was going this way. Okay. Uh, it was going from zone 5 down to 9. Or, in, you know, like this. And that was definitely not a Leonid. It would actually be going back toward this radiant. So you do see meteors, of course, uh, throughout the sky randomly. But a Leonid is specifically going to be aligned with and pointing to one end or the other here. And it's going to be the end where it originates and it, it terminates out here somewhere. And they're coming at us through that radiant. Uh, Ghostfish, we may have 
seen the surge such as it was, uh, that first bright one I saw was right about at the mark of 1 o'clock a.m. Eastern Time. Well, they predicted a surge from 1 to 1.30. Okay. Uh, it was actually, it was, I think it was 12.51 your time. I mean, you know what's going to happen, right? We'll say, okay, it was a bust this year. We'll turn it off, and just as we turn it off, this massive meteor is going to just go blazing through the field, do a curly cue, do things that meteors never do, uh, proving the existence of extraterrestrial life and, and non-ballistic motion, and we will have missed it by a click of a button. So I feel like I should just let this go, right? We're not missing anything. When I show you something else, uh, we're not actually missing any of it. So don't worry about it. I am recording it, actually. At the same time. Uh, so, so here is... Well, this is our screen here. This is our uh, observatory in uh, Arizona. I just want to quickly bring up our bring up our preview here. Yeah, as you can see, we've got some clouds out there. So, uh, no worky. All right, so let's go back to this. Very nice. I suppose they should put a solar observatory in Philadelphia. Why? Because it's always sunny in Philadelphia. Is that what you're watching right now? No. Well. I don't watch that show, actually. Okay. I understood the reference. Uh, Ray uh, says, so all hope for the surge is gone. No, no, not at all. Um, you have to understand that the people that make these predictions um, are just basing it on some statistical study to indicate that there might be um, a cloud that the Earth is going to pass through. We don't know for sure. We don't see it and say, oh, we're heading for the cloud now. There's the cloud. That's not how it works. It's just based on uh, the understanding they have of the area and uh, of the, uh, you know, uh, the comet's uh, tail that was left behind. And uh, that's the only thing that they go on, to be honest. Yeah. One early prediction for the surge I saw said maybe 350 to 450 an hour. Uh, a more recent prediction I saw said more like 50 to 200 an hour. Well, so who knows? If they said 5 to 10 an hour, that would still be too much. <laughs> well, uh, typically yearly, and it's a peak at uh, 10, 10 to 15 or 15 to 20 an hour. Mike Hedrick says two top right of your mouth, so like right here. All right, he says uh, zone six, so that's over here uh, at 133.20. Okay, when I go back to look at the chat later on tonight or tomorrow, uh, I will check that out. Is Isabella still here? I haven't seen her in a while. Well, maybe she's gone to bed or she was waking up. She has some time yet. Oh yeah, she should be waking up by now. Oh, she was here earlier. Yeah. No, it's 8.34 in the morning over there. Yeah, it is. All right, Ian, Ian says he's got to get back to work. Finishes at 8 a.m. Uh, you're welcome. I'm happy to do the stream with you. Uh, uh, it's great to have you back, Ian. So we'll see you again. Thanks for coming, man. And Mike says very short and small meteors over here is what he was talking about. All right. Very good.
can see all of Leo now. See the three stars in the triangle that make his back end. One, two, three. One, two, three. Right there. When you call one, it's called Zosma. Yeah. And I forget the lower one. That's his hindquarters. And then, this... and then that one's his tail. That's Denebola. Yeah. It means tail of the lion. Yeah, just like Deneb is the tail of the swan in Cygnus. Or Deneb Kaitos is the tail of the whale. Yeah. Justin Langford says, thank you for this live stream. Oh, you're more than welcome, Justin. I'm probably going to let it run all night so I have a record of it. I'm also... Uh, I also am doing this stream as well. Uh, it's uh, we're capturing everything out there, so we'll see that too and make that into a video for tomorrow. I did a video actually of uh, last night's uh, sky out in Arizona. It got cloudy, so we didn't really have a whole lot. Uh, now, Daryl, you said that the moon rises when? Uh, it was 12.30 some odd. Your time? 12.37 or something like that. Well, it's 1.37 and I don't see it. Uh, that's what uh, Weather Underground said. Actually, I think I see the glow of the moon. You might, but if you look here, this is the, the real time. The moon is. I see, it says moon right to the left of the east side. Yeah, but if we turn off the ground. Okay, oops, sorry. If we turn off the ground. Uh, we can see that um, the moon is just, just rising now. Yep, that's what I just said. No, I know that, but uh, it's just. Uh, it's, in other words, it's just rising now. It th that doesn't look like it's. Uh, well, let me see again. Uh, uh, Being off yep, by an uh, hour is pretty, uh, pretty yes. suspicious. Weather Underground, Terryville, Connecticut, said moon rises at 12:37. Well, they are wrong. They're an hour off. They didn't get their. They, they forgot to adjust the time. <laughs> well. Hey there, Frost PB. How are you, Gustavo Soros? How are you? What do you mean you don't see anyone in the chat? There's lots of people here. I suspect he means he doesn't see any meteors. That's what I was thinking he means, but uh, we'll let him tell us because I'm not sure. Um. And we have 102 people watching. Nice to have you all here. Make sure you join us. You know, click uh, the subscribe button. All right. Uh, and uh, if you hit the subscribe button, you know, what you'll do is you'll be privy to our Deep Sky Observatory stream where we capture deep sky objects, nebulae, galaxies. Uh, and some of our galaxies are literally jaw droppers. Uh, and... Uh, Nebulae where stars and planets themselves are even, are being born um, And uh, you know, we show you all these images and we take pictures of all these images and then make them available to you To you for free and you can get there by this going to this portal skytourlive.com or skytourlive.org And when you go here you, you'll you scroll down and you can go to directories where you can see images We've done for the entire last year download them use them as backgrounds do whatever you like. Do your own processing on our raw files, which you also provide. It's all out there. And it's all explained to you at astro at, at skytourlive.com. So uh, please uh, subscribe and join. Um, it's all free. We don't charge for a darn thing. You know? So I am really, really uh, hoping that you guys will 
take advantage of that because it's a lot of fun. Um, and this type of thing we do, the media stream, this is rare. We don't do this very often. Most of it is our nighttime observatory uh, that we do. And that nighttime observatory is out in the middle of the Arizona desert. I'm 2,600 miles away in Connecticut. That's where this view is coming from that we see right here. And uh, this is around my neighborhood, my house, uh, where I am. And um, so uh, go ahead and join. And, and when you click the bell, uh, click also uh, the drop down there and say all notifications to encourage you to uh, possibly see more uh, announcements from us. Because sometimes people don't get the notifications. Lost for words, thank you so much. That's very kind of you. Uh, makes me feel good. Um, and I want to say hello to M. Perlati. How are you? Listen to Astronomy FM Radio. Good stuff. We have an astronomy show too, Sunday nights from 6 to 8 on KGRA. That's called uh, Sky Tour Radio. This is Sky Tour Livestream. The companion radio show is called Sky to Radio. It's astronomy, all about astronomy, and extraterrestrial life. I'm an astronomer. That's what I went to school for. And so uh, I spent a lot of time learning about uh, life on Earth and how life developed here. wrote a book about it called The Populated Universe. It's available all over the world on Amazon. And um, it's just a, a really, really... Uh, deep look uh, in lay talk it doesn't take you don't offer you a single equation um, which I could but I didn't and uh, it just discusses uh, why uh, life is probably the rule not the exception in the universe and has to do with our carbon base our bilateral symmetry all that's explained in the book you know uh, but I'll answer any questions about it if you guys want to talk about that we have some more time. Go ahead, Daryl. Speaking of the show, do you think there'll be one this Sunday? I'm not sure. It depends on Bill. Uh, but I don't have one written for tomorrow. Uh, the show is, is live many times, but sometimes when uh, we have tough schedules, we do replays. And we have Sky Tour Radio, Astronomy uh, Radio Show. Uh, we've got, uh, what, about 100 or more shows? that people can they can pick from to play so it that's something that we can uh you know we can uh have done <clears throat> i don't think we'll have one for tomorrow we have thanksgiving coming up and all that oh that's right yeah and then uh zexy's 226 says what kind of equations well if i wanted to talk about equations i could take you down we can discuss ween's law the reason why stars have the colors they do we could talk about black body radiation equations. We could talk about uh, equations uh, for light uh, waves. We could talk about all kinds of other things, like, for instance, um, uh, the uh, ideal gas law, PV equals nRT. Uh, we could talk about gravitational equations, GMM over R squared. We could talk about the fall off as being the, the uh, square of the distance so when something's twice as far away gravity's four times smaller and in, in, in amplitude um, same thing with light uh, so um, I mean, there's so many different ways to put math around what's going on in the universe and that's what I've spent my life doing professionally so um, you know that's the thing the problem I had with that is that when you talk to people who want to just explore the night sky, but they still want to learn about astronomy, you know, you have to make the decision. Well, I, I'm not going to start taking them down the path of learning equations because equations just make people get glassy eyed and want to just walk away. But if they understand the concepts, if they understand what is the reason why things operate the way they do then that actually becomes enough if they want to learn the equations i can be happy to do that but if they want to learn about the objects i can show them that you know why do gas clouds glow red from ionization what is ionization 
what causes ionization? Why does it happen with certain energies of light rather than, uh, you know, a flashlight beam or something? Why can't that do it? You know, so there's there's a lot of physics built into astronomy because it's mostly physics, actually. But you don't have to know that to appreciate it and understand it. But someone who does know that and appreciates that, who then translates all that complexity into something that you can understand and take away and then build on. See, that's that's somewhat rare, and that's that's what I think I do, um, you know. And I I think that's where I fit in in astronomy, is try to take the complex and make it uh, explainable, you know. Uh, Simon Thompson says. I love this hobby, but I also love my sleep. I tend to put up my gear. Uh, I tend to set up my gear with my uh, with it with an imaging sequence in Nina. Okay, Nina is a automated uh, uh, astronomy uh, system to operate your telescope and camera. Uh, and uh, and then he goes and go to bed. How do you cope with little sleep during the day? Pure excitement, man. Let me tell you. Um, I used to work the midnight to dawn shift in a major observatory, uh, working on a parallax program. And then I would go and do classes all day long and then come back that night and do it again. Meanwhile, in the afternoon here and there, I'd sleep for here and there an hour, two hours, and then be ready to go. I don't think I could do that again. Uh, I, 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 I don't believe I could do that again, you know. But I have stayed up all night uh, many times um, recently just to do astronomy, as you'll see when we do the, the Deep Sky Observatory. Our, I think our record is five and a half hours. Daryl, I think. Didn't we do like a five and a half hour stream one night? Uh, I don't recall. Um, we did close to five hours the other night. That's true, don't we? Yeah, and once you get going, you know, it's really hard to... It's really hard to um, stop, you know. I mean, I, and they know me as I'm Mark. Just one more, D'Antonio. It's like I'll just do one more, just one more. Um, I had to ask you to do one more the other night. Yeah, you did, and we did. It was cool. That's what we saw in to see 1097. It was 1097 or 1079. <clears throat> 1097. Okay. The galaxy. The yeah, spiral yeah. galaxy. Yeah, yeah. Bart, Bart the Bart Spiral. That was beautiful. This is 226 says, very well said, thank you. I'm about to graduate in chemistry, so I was curious about running correlations. Actually, uh, there's way, way, way more correlations in the chemical and chemistry world because all of the periodic table elements come from nucleosynthesis and other processes. Uh, we have the slow process and the fast process, uh, the slow process known as neutron capture. Uh, that's another one that's... Uh, and that depends on beta decay, um, and uh, that that is pretty interesting. Uh, okay, uh, Hedrick is uh, Michael Hedrick says, getting busy zone two or three. Let's just put this up to remind people where two or three is. This is two and three. All right, let's keep a watch on that. So there's a lot of um, a lot of processes in chemistry. I'll give you an example. Um, we talk about dark nebula. Dark nebulae are carbon molecules, okay, in deep space, and silicate uh, uh, compounds that grow into interstellar dust. That dust, uh, not just in the solar system, but in between stars and in these dark nebulae, uh, whether carbon or silicate based, those will attract uh, other particles and ices will form on their surface. We'll have methanol, we'll have formaldehyde ice, we'll have. Uh, you know, uh, cyanide. We'll have uh, you know, water ices, carbon dioxide ice, and the list goes on. And so, these become a uh, a storehouse, a panoply of chemical compounds that are in these dust particles. And uh, when a star is formed in a nebula, that star will heat up these ices. Those volatiles will boil off, and you'll have just the dust left. And then you have those compounds floating around. Uh, with the dust and this is the raw materials from which planets are made um, and so that's the kind of thing that for me dark nebula are where it's at 
those things that you can't see is the more, are the most important things in the universe. And uh, so that's I, I I like the dark nebula very very much, and we see them a lot in Sky Tour live stream. We go to these dark nebula. We did them the other night, you know, and we show these gorgeous dark nebulae, um, you know, and so I guess I guess it would be kind of important to, you know, maybe. Oops, I don't want to do that. Uh, let me do uh, this first of all. Show you that. Okay, that's fine. And we're still doing clouds here. Okay, so we got this. Still watching this. But at the same time, I want to show you a couple other things. So what I'm going to do is bring that up in a way that won't disturb the live view here. Uh, as a malak. What's the biggest meteor observed? Uh, in recent history, it would probably be the Chelyabinsk uh, meteor that crashed in Russia. Uh, that was, what, 2012, I believe. And uh, that was huge. It was the size of a house. Uh, it blew out security doors. Uh, it caused lots and lots of damage to uh, people and property. I literally, you know, the Russians love their their dash cams and their security cams. So there was way, there was tons and tons of available footage of these objects, uh, of the shockwave from this object destroying uh, things. You saw windows get smashed. You saw metal security doors bend in half and break inward from the shockwave. Just incredible stuff. I think you remember that, Daryl. Daryl's still with us, I'm sure. Sorry, Charlie Yes, I remember that. Yeah. I don't think it was that long ago. I think it was 2012. Okay, 2013. I thought it was 2012, but that's not too many, not too far away. All right. Yeah. As Malak says, I saw that footage. That rock was fast and furious. Yeah, it was, and. Um, it's a good thing that it entered the atmosphere the way it did. Uh, if it was any more direct, you know, downward, uh, that shock wave uh, would have been more intense and the shock would have been spread out over a smaller area, meaning it would have destroyed not just broken windows, but destroyed the buildings themselves. Uh, and luckily it wasn't straight down on top like that. That would have been just absolutely terrible. All right, let's see here. Is this one I can use? I can barely hear you, Daryl. That uh, would have been like, uh, I'm having a brain lock at the moment. Uh, uh, big one, back in like 1910, whatever. Oh, Tunguska. Tunguska, thank you. Yeah, I, that was like Tunguska, yeah. Well, it could have been if it had been a more direct path. Yeah. Yep, no doubt. Okay, just to give you an idea what we look at with SkyTour Livestream, this uh, is an actual image we took with SkyTour Livestream. And people saw it. This is just the other night. We took this image. Uh, this is, as Daryl points out, too, this is NGC 605. It's a, uh, this is the Galaxy Mesher 33 and Triangulum. 604. 604, thank you. And uh, up here you have these these bluish green areas these are supernovae that have gone off in this galaxy the bluish regions here these are areas where there's hot young stars that are born in here and 
This galaxy we're seeing is over 2 million plus light years away. It's like 2.7 or 2.6 million light years away. And we took this image. This is a, an image that took about 25 seconds to make, right? And that's what we see with our telescope. You're basically looking at potentially other civilizations looking back at you, right? That's kind of what I think about this, this stuff. That so, took more than 25 seconds. Well, remember, it's this process, too. It's stacked. Well, yeah, but I mean, it was a bunch of 25-second images. Yeah, yeah. But it was 25 seconds. The telescope intrinsically gets everything it needs in 25 seconds, and all the stack is doing is removing the noise. So, all right, so let's go back to this now. You can see my trees, some of the trees here in the uh, area. Here is Regulus again. Here is the backward sickle. The radiant is now dead center in our view. I see Simon Thompson has asked a question. Uh, do you know why Measure 83 and NGC 300 are both called the Southern Pinwheel Galaxy? Both are different galaxies and both have the same name. Confused. Uh, I don't understand why there's two of the same name either, Simon. But pinwheels are a rather common thought process when you think about certain galaxies, right? They do look like these pinwheels. They all, Many of them do. The one I just showed you did. Uh, as Malak says, but what the, uh, but what are those uh, other civilizations think of us when they look at us? That's a very good question. What do they think of us? Well, first of all, they may still be wondering whether we're there or not, because if they're with the tech, at the technological level that we are, then they certainly just wonder whether we're still there or whether we're out there. We don't know. We've never contacted anybody, and we can't yet. We don't have the technology to do that. You know, but that's the way it is, <clears throat> unfortunately. If those other civilizations were in the <coughs> uh, M33 pinwheel galaxy, well, yeah. what they were saying was 2.6 million years ago, so we wouldn't even have existed yet. That's right. We would not have existed at that point. But they would also though what they would see is that there was life here um that they can do oh, not from 2.6 million light years away huh not from 2.6 million light years away they wouldn't well why not if they could actually uh okay our let me explain that all right we're looking for oxygen signatures in the atmospheres of exoplanets now, with our primitive capabilities, we're only looking with a 21-foot diameter telescope mirror, and that's the James Webb. And it's going to only indirectly be able to see oxygen based on all, uh, oxygen atoms colliding, which creates an infrared signature that it can see. Um, but um, if you look in our atmosphere, you know, Stephen Hawking said we should hide from an alien civilization, keep our heads low, don't let them know we're here, because they could wipe us out if they wanted to. But the fact is, um, we, we've actually found exoplanets in other galaxies, all right, as well. Now, uh, granted, they're bigger exoplanets and there are special circumstances, but if we can do that, then why can't other civilizations do far better than that if they're, say, 10,000 years ahead of us or 150,000 years ahead of us in technology? So, um, oxygen is the great... Uh, uh, I think clue, you know. Um, if you look at the the atmosphere of the planet, uh, you go back to the Permian period. There was roughly thirty three percent oxygen level in the atmosphere, but the first oxygen uh, was appearing in the planet over two and a half billion years ago, and those are phytoplankton making oxygen in our oceans. And that oxygen buildup was actually very quick, and they called it, uh, as they've discovered recently, it's called the Great Oxidation Event. It happened very quickly. 
So much so that it's, it was a, a very quick signal that there was something else causing it. Oxygen can come from geologic reasons, from rock strata, chemical interactions, and things like that. So purely non-aerobic things can make oxygen, but not in the quantities that appeared in our atmosphere. That was a very strict, unique signal that says something was replenishing this oxygen because oxygen doesn't want to stay in the atmosphere. It'll dive out of the atmosphere and bond with compounds in the ground the first chance it gets. Our, our oxygen is doing that now. But the phytoplankton are making more oxygen to keep up with that. And that's how that works, right? Well, an alien race can also see that we're making oxygen. Uh, in our atmosphere as well at a rate that is far more than would be expected from geological reasons or from chemical reasons pretty cool and I think that if you if you take that and consider that possibility then you can see how the signal that there has been life here has gone out two and a half billion light years right now, we can't see a planet two and a half billion light years away, okay? But it doesn't mean that an alien race with additional technology can't. Um, if I was an alien race, I'd probably send out probes in all directions to targeted spots in galaxies and then just stop and listen and look around and do the things the Kepler Space Telescope was doing or that TESS, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, was doing. Look for transits. Uh, wherever it goes and then if it saw a bunch of interesting uh, candidates it might go to them if I could if we could do that so uh, we're not advanced to do that yet but if we get to say 10,000 years more advancement maybe we can we're already seeing the possibility of getting to the nearest stars in just about a week's time that's Alpha Centauri using uh, a special warp drive called the Alcubierre drive right now, it doesn't exist yet, it requires a vast amount of energy, but a lot less than they thought it might need. And that could take us to the nearest stars in as little as a week, and not the 10 to 12,000 years it would take us with a rocket, okay, using all the different projects uh, you know, uh, and so forth. So, uh, we're primitive. Alien races may not be. So they would be able to see oxygen in our atmosphere from a long way away. Just like we can see now, we just can't see it as far um, because we don't have the ability to discern uh, the difference too well at certain distances. Remember, <clears throat> it was only a few years ago that we could not see Earth-sized planets in the sky. Now we can see Earth-sized planets. What happened? Why did that happen? Change of technology. Increasing the ability to resolve small objects and the capability to uh, mathematically deduce uh, where positions of objects may be <clears throat> based on a variety of characteristics of a planetary system elsewhere. So if we can do it, they can do it. <coughs> I see you, Isabella. <coughs> Hello, Sandra Moynihan. Mm. The shooting stars uh, should be right about, this is the radiance, so you're going to see them anywhere in this radial direction from Leo. But it doesn't look like the Leonids have been very uh, profitable for anybody this year. <laughs> Simon Thompson says, do you have any plans to do talks and presentations in Australia? Yes, I do. <clears throat> but I have to... I have to get someone to sponsor me down there, someone to uh, bring me down there. Because if someone brings me down there, I'll go all over the country and do talks for people. Um, I actually do a talk that's been getting very well, res well uh, good reviews and reception uh, about the real physics that might uh, provide uh, the, the way in which actual UFOs work. Uh, and that has to do with uh, string theory but you don't have to know string theory to understand it. It's really cool. <clears throat> That's a whole nother thing. But I would uh, definitely do talks in Australia. It's a bucket list thing. 
I'd like to go to all the major cities in, in Australia. I want to go to Uluru as well. Who doesn't? I mean, you can't go to really go there really. I want to go to Siding Springs. I want to drive through Cooper Pedy because just to say I did. <laughs> you know. I want to get a Darwin. Yeah. I'd like to go there um, and just uh, spend a month there if I could. You know, just uh, flying around and seeing different places. <clears throat> Isabella processed one of our shots. Sharpless 2 126, which we shot the other night. That came out pretty. Mike Hedrick has a question. I'll wait for your question. You might be right, Cosmic Ray. It's always a crapshoot. I'd love to go there for that, yeah. Uh, Simon Thompson talking about the Astro Fest. Mike says, would we be scared if we were in the moon? No atmosphere to catch the meteors. Um, yeah, well, you know, they would definitely hit with full force. They wouldn't be burned up. So even tiny particles might hit at several thousand kilometers per hour. And those are like little bullets. Uh, you know, it's pretty interesting how we had astronauts on the moon and... They never got hit with a meteorite or micrometeoroid or anything. I mean, it certainly would have torn right through their suits and their legs or their chests or whatever. Uh, so that's pretty bad. <clears throat> Josh Blanton says, thanks for this. I'm doing public viewings in my town in eastern Kentucky. Um, do you have suggestions for how to project the telescope? view to a projection screen. I use a 10 inch reflector and AQ uh, 6R mount. Uh, there's a few ways to do that. Um, one way people do that is they attach a camera to the telescope and they go from an output of the camera, usually a USB to the PC, the PC to uh, a, a big screen. Um, and that's something people do a lot. Yeah, Uluru's, yeah, I remember that James Dugan, yep. <sighs> what do you think, Daryl? Should we call it? Yeah. Okay. I'm going into bed. Yeah, it's, uh, it's after 2 a.m. I'll let this run for the rest of the night. Um... But if you want to go to bed, uh, you go right ahead. I'll probably follow. Uh, but we'll just uh, we'll let this play through for the rest of the night and see what we have in the morning. But it doesn't look like we had much of a meteor shower this year, does it? Well, it was all a big water. Yeah, yeah. They always are. They always are. <clears throat> Bleeding Eyeball 27 says he's going to get out of the cold. He saw a couple, and that was enough. Yeah. Some years they're magnificent, and some years they're non existent. Oh, there's one right there. Devil. That was a nice one. You saw it too. And it was it was a lid. It was indeed. 
All right. That's a good way to end this. But then you say, well, if I saw one, maybe I'll see more. <laughs> I know, right? All right. I know, just one more, right? That was beautiful. Hey, we should say we're going to stop like like every five minutes and we'll see another one. And then Simon Thompson says, you can't go to bed now. <laughs> Here they come, he says. Yeah, right? Yeah, thank you, uh, Mike Hedrick, for giving us that time and location. That's fantastic. That was a real, that was a classic one, too. Yep. Nice and green. Most of the ones I've seen tonight have been over to the right. Yeah. Uh, to the south, I suppose. Yeah. Oh, uh, well, heck, I'll stick around a few minutes. Okay. I bet. I don't know. I, I shouldn't say anything. I know, right? Here comes the moon. You see it? You don't see it yet, but it's down there. Yes, I see it. Oh, you do, but they don't, because it's not. Uh, I have to. Uh, I have to do this. So there's the moon, right there. Here it is. Um, so was, okay, Simon, was it, uh, the <clears> meteor <throat> body itself looked gold to me and, and, uh, with a green tail. It had green, I saw it. <clears throat> Let me go move the camera a little bit to the right and up. I think that would be better to kind of go to the right a little bit, yeah? I've seen nothing on the left. Everything we've yeah. seen is coming from the right. So let me put this more to the left and look up a little more. All right? Okay. All right. I'll be right back. <clears throat> Camp Town ladies sing this song, do da do da. Camp Town racetrack five miles long, all the do da day. Bonnie, are you still here? I used to sing a lot more than I do nowadays. I used to sing when Mark was going outside to move his telescope uh, when he was still set up in Connecticut. I'd do it just to entertain people while he was gone. Oh, there you are. Hello, Bonnie. When I was saying I was leaving, I didn't get a chance to say goodnight to you. I'll give you a presumptive good night now. Uh, I'm going to stick around a little longer. That meteor we saw was a, a bit of a motivator. Isabella, if I was in the mood, yes, I could sing other songs. It's late. I'm tired. Isabella, my father was a musician earlier in his life, before I was ever born. He was a country western musician. Or like they said on the Blues Brothers, we play both kinds of music, country and western. And one night at the dinner table, I said I wanted to learn how to play the drums. And my father, old gruff guy that he was, he goes, no damn son of mine will ever be a damn musician. And my mom got this lick on her face. 
and uh, I didn't learn until much later in life. My mom made my dad quit being a musician, get a real job, because they kept having kids. Uh, so maybe he blamed me for not getting to be a musician anymore. But no, I don't play any instruments. One of my sisters did, though. God, they let her, they got her a piano, and she played the violin. And uh, let's see, I don't remember what all instruments she played. She wound up playing the bassoon, which was almost unheard of back in the late 60s, early 70s, a female bassoonist. And she wound up uh, being the bassoon player for the city symphony orchestra. That was back in the days when, you know, women didn't do that sort of thing. That's very cool. She wound up being a federal judge. Wow. Then she retired and played the stock market. All right, hang on. I got one more thing I have to do out there. I realized that I have a cover on the camera, and the cover is impinging on the camera right here. Let me go move it. I'll be right back. Yeah, they were talking about that while you were gone. All right, I'll be right back. The father I knew was a carpenter. But before I was ever born, they called him Wild Bill Mason, and he was a musician. He had his own band. He uh, he played the guitar, he played the trumpet, he played a bass violin, bull fiddle you'd call it, I guess, if you're playing country music, and uh, I guess he was a pretty wild and crazy, crazy guy. much better yep looks like you fixed it much better okay when I was out there I didn't see any meteors but here's Regulus and the backward sickle and there's that rear triangle of Leo right there and there's a radiant, so now we have all this space here to look for meteors. Isabella, you said that the uh, action set broke in Photoshop? The action set, folks, uh, in Photoshop, it, these are little programs you can write with in Photoshop to do tasks to help you do repetitive things uh, over and over without having to do them manually every time. Uh, you might you might call them macros in another language. Uh, and I came up with a whole bunch of actions to help do certain things. Uh, but the reason that they're broken is most likely because Photoshop can't find them. So I think you would probably have to make sure you put them in the correct directory. That's the problem, Isabella. I'm sure it is. Hedrick, uh, Google is your friend. But the meteorites come in at um, any, somewhere around 15,000 kilometers per hour. Um, so you can check them out. Oh, I Th bet it's more than that. Well, 
In just a second, I'll find out. Okay. Seventy-two kilometers per second. Okay. Which is, uh, get Mr. Calculator <laughs> here. <clears throat> two hundred fifty-nine thousand two hundred kilometers an hour uh, times point six two. They are traveling one hundred and sixty thousand seven hundred four miles an hour. That was so a little there. deep on average. So there. So there. That's pretty darn fast. Yeah. It's late. I don't even remember what I said a minute ago. What was that? 160,000 miles an hour? That's darn tootin'. What's happening this time of night when we're running into uh, Leonid specks of dust out in space? Uh, uh, at midnight, uh, Leo rises right about midnight, and this is not unusual for meteor showers. It's one reason they say they're generally best between local midnight and dawn. Uh, the Leonids are a great example because they the radiant rises right about midnight, unsurprisingly. And uh, at midnight, uh, when we face east, we are facing the direction the Earth is moving in space. And uh, we are facing right into the direction that we are intersecting the stream of the, of the uh, meteor fragments. And by dawn, the radiant point will be roughly overhead. And um, that's when we'll see them there. And uh, between midnight and dawn, well, uh, that is the direction we're moving in space. And at sunrise, uh, we're basically moving directly toward that point on the ecliptic that uh, would be closest to straight overhead. I wish I could do a whiteboard here. I could draw a diagram. That's something I've always wanted to do on uh, the radio show, too. Yeah, I have a... Well, the remote... The remote computer operation system has a whiteboard built in. Uh, and uh, it broke a couple months ago, and I can't get it to work again. But you could do a... A John Madden thing we could circle something and draw arrows and and that doesn't yeah. work anymore I used to like that <clears throat> uh, I had a, a tablet at one time you know a drawing tablet mm -hmm. and uh, I never could really get the hang of it uh, I'm a left hand I'm southpaw mm -hmm. I'm left-handed uh, I learned to use the mouse right-handed so I tried to use the tablet right-handed and I can't draw with a darn with my right hand, so I quit using it. Okay. I gave it to a girl. <coughs> but maybe if I had a whiteboard, I could... <coughs> I don't know. Do we, people even use tablets anymore? Yeah. Drawing tablets? Yeah, well, I mean, there are certain tablets that, that people will still use, yes. Well, that would be a case, though, where uh, 
I should probably, there are stock diagrams out there I could find of what I just described. Uh, like your point of view when you're standing on the earth at midnight versus uh, sunset versus midnight versus sunrise uh, to see where you are on the earth at that time. And uh, yeah. uh, you can hopefully get a feel for it. Same thing goes like when I try to describe the line of nodes when eclipses happen. Uh, those two intersecting planes of the moon's orbit around Earth and Earth's orbit around the sun. When the intersection line of those two planes points at the sun, that is when eclipses happen. <clears throat> that would be another good diagram to have. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's Siobhan. I'm tired. I'm blabbering. Siobhan says, I actually live in a town where this lady was asleep and a meteorite came through her ceiling and landed in her house. Um, I've heard that story and saw photos of the lady after the injury. Because uh, it came down through the roof, right? And went into the basement, bounced off the basement floor, came up through the floor of her living room <clears throat> and struck her in the thigh. Is that not what? It, is that the person you're talking about, Siobhan? That was one fifty-four. Yeah, but she I might remember hearing. That. She got the huge bruise on her hip. Yes. Yeah. Then there was a guy. Uh, there was a meteor strike here in Weathersfield, Connecticut, <clears throat> and then another one two miles away from that same place uh, a year later. <laughs> so don't ever go to that town in Connecticut. Yeah, it landed on the couch. I think it came back up through the basement floor and hit her, if I recall. <clears throat> no, she was in bed, I think. and it. Uh, yeah, that's the one. That's the one, Siobhan. However, it, it caromed around inside her house, and then it wound up in the head. Yeah. A huge bruise on her head. Well, the picture of her, she's on a couch. and I don't know if that meant she got injured on the couch or she was in bed when it happened. And when the press came, she was on the couch. Uh, could have been. Uh, either way, I do remember the image of her on the couch with that big bruise on her hip. Well, she's one of the few people with the million dollar hips. Of course, she's not with us anymore. I'm sure she's done. <clears throat> passed on. Um, interesting. And there was the... Uh... I do remember the case of Ann Hodges. Yeah. It was the car in, uh, I think it was That's in right. New York. It was a Chevy Citation, if I remember correctly. Yeah, it got slammed by a meter right in the trunk. Yep. I saw that somewhere just a day or two ago. They have that car on display somewhere. That's right, they do. It really tore up the back end of the car. Yeah. Punched a hole right through it. Hit the yeah. pavement. It is. Pretty cool. I would like to see something like that, but uh, some things you just want to see from a respectful distance, you know. You like tornadoes. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> volcanoes or avalanches or. Yeah, I, I'd like to see a volcano up close. I haven't seen any of those yet. Define up close. Um, where I had to be close enough to wear the heat suit. Uh, no thanks. I would like to see that. I would like to be far enough away that I wasn't in danger. Yeah. No, no pyroclastic flows or lava flows or lava bombs falling out of the sky. Hmm. <laughs> Yeah, no, uh, pyroclastic flows are, are not too exciting. Yeah. <clears throat> Just ask the people in the town of St. Pierre on uh, uh, St. Martin, right? When Mont Pele blew up. Yep. I saw the after effect of many 
avalanches when I lived up in the high country. I never got to see one actually happen. Um, I got there about five minutes after an avalanche one day. It was right on the highway. I was driving to work, and the road was closed. The avalanche had come down the mountainside and buried the road. Wow. <clears throat> That's pretty cool. I've known people, uh, oh, a guy I used to work with, he said they had a meteorite land in their yard one time. Well, I, I don't doubt that's very possible. He said it was icy cold when they picked it up. I believe that, too. And the last <clears throat> he remembered of it, they were using it for a doorstop in his parents' house. <clears throat> if it's an iron meteorite, it wasn't worth much. Yeah, it was an iron meteorite, I think. Uh, so, Siobhan, are you saying you live in Alabama? Did you say you live in the town in Alabama where this happened? They're calling it, she was hit by the bruiser from the sky. <laughs> I think that was in Alabama where that lady was. Um, Siobhan, uh, that Silicaga. story was... I'm sorry? Silicaga is the name of the... Or Silicaga. Silicaga. Name of the town. Wow. Siobhan says... Uh, he mentions a meteorite that burned down the house in California. That was not yeah, so. That was not so, yeah. That, the meteorite was not hot couldn't have started a fire only if it hit like something that sparked the fire but that was just coincidental <clears throat> wow so that's the Hodges meteorite Uh, Isabella heard the music from Sky to Livestream, our startup music. Um, no, it doesn't mean the stream is over. It is 2.30, and I'm not seeing any additional activity. So we're going to automate the rest of the stream for the rest of the night. Um, and so I will call it, and I'm going to head to bed. Daryl's going to go to bed, probably. Yeah. And then we'll be back. Um... Uh, as early as tomorrow for a regular SkyTour live stream, if it's going to be clear in Arizona, again, it's usually clear there when it's not clear here. Uh, so we should do this. So this is what it looks like out there now. And we will be uh, waiting for it to clear up. So now that I'm saying we're going to go, I'm guessing we're going to see the big major you know, meteor here. So let's all say it at once. Okay, we're going to go now. Yep, that's it. Time to go. And we should see a big giant meteor now. I'm going to hold my breath until uh, I see a meteor. Well, Daryl's going to pass out in a moment, guys. <clears throat> Yeah, I will. I will sleep just fine, Cindy. Uh, this stream will keep going. Um, <clears throat> yeah, let's see. If I do this. Got that. Alright, and that's this guy. Don't worry. I've got you covered. That's that guy. Alright, and now this guy. Oh, it's clearing up out there. So it's actually getting a little clearer out there. 
Okay, Mark, I'm going to disconnect here. Y'all have a good night. Take care and have fun. All right, Daryl. I will talk to you tomorrow or whatever. Probably stream tomorrow night if it's clear. Okay. Have a good night. All right, Daryl. We'll see you later. Night, Bonnie. Good night, Daryl. All right. Well, <clears throat> this is the ongoing view. Uh, and I will just make a change to this. Okay. So, I know it wasn't all that much going on tonight, guys, but did you have a good time? I kind of had it. It was fun hanging out with you guys. Ah, thank you, Cindy. All right, let's see what this gives us here. Oh, look at that. Oh. <clears throat> Not that. <clears throat> All right. So probably a little more space in there. That's good, a little more spacing there. And there we are. Okay, so what you're gonna see on this screen uh, for the rest of the night will be the All Sky Cam in Arizona, which I should probably say that's the All Sky Cam. Probably the best thing to do there. All right. <clears throat> and this is the Sky Tour East cam here, uh, which we will be monitoring throughout the course of the night. All right. There we go. Drop this down. There we go. Okay. I don't think I can change this to any bigger size. I think I'm stuck with it like that. All right, guys. Well, you know what? We'll let this run. We'll see what happens. I did it the other night. No big deal. Went out there. The camera was not frozen. It was still there. Uh, no animals had made off with it because that's about all that would happen around here is some animal might have taken it. Uh, but at least I'll get a, the last nose print of something on the camera when, I, when it does it. Uh, so we'll check this out if you want to. Keep looking at this if you like to. And I will... I'll be back in the morning to check on everything. But until then, I hope you guys have a good night. We'll leave the music running, and we will basically have a good time, and I will, uh, I'll will i be back at some other point, so I'll do that. That other point's going to be probably tomorrow. Well, it is tomorrow here. <laughs> anyway, I'm out for now. And I will talk to you guys a little bit later. So good night and have fun watching. I will talk to you uh, on the next stream. And, and again, if you haven't subscribed, do subscribe to Sky Tour Livestream. You have to see our beautiful imagery that we take. And it's all free. And you get to take it. People put it up on their walls and make prints and metal canvas and framed under glass. It's just, And we have that service too on our site. So that's at SkyTourLive.com. That's the portal into everything we're doing. So check it out. 
Uh, we have two observatories now. We're going to have a third one uh, uh, very soon. Um, and um, and the, each instrument does a different type of thing. <clears throat> the one out here, when it goes in place, is going to be uh, taking spectra of objects so we can actually see what they're made of, as well as taking visual imagery. So that's something that we're looking forward to doing. Uh, but I will uh, keep you posted on that as well. All right. And then uh, the one that's currently out here where this uh, webcam, uh, not webcam, but this all sky cam is, that is a wide field system that's four full moons across in size in terms of its field and three full moons tall. So it's a big wide field view over two degrees across and one and a half degrees tall. The next one we're going to get is going to be different than that. It's going to be a focused system that is, uh, has a highly magnified view and the beauty of it is that all of these observatories can be online at the same time looking at the same object and seeing it three different ways. How about that, huh? So we'll see a wide field view of a beautiful nebula then a close-in view of a section of the nebula and maybe even the spectrum of the nebula so you can see what it's made of chemically. So uh, this is where we're heading with Sky Through Livestream. And that's just three of the observatories. We actually have a plan for a fourth on the books already uh, that's mobile, goes anywhere in the country, and can tie into uh, our systems. So that's another one that we're planning. Um, and I have the energy to do that and more. Ah, so much of that. It's just so much fun. Anyway, you guys have a good night. Uh, enjoy. And, uh, well... I'll probably check in a few times in the middle of the night because I just can't stay away from this. All right. I'll see you later, guys. Good night, all.